any nice things to say about a peg warmer who made his first appearance and died in the same comic? Well, we're gonna try. Here to talk about DJ are Steve, Paul, and Rob! Yes, 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 it's episode 334 of G.I. Joburg, and we're talking about DJ. I thought we were supposed to talk about cool toys in these toys-focused episodes. Well, it, I, I mean, you know, it. we're talking about toys that all three of us own. So, unfortunately, <laughs> sometimes we're going to come up with ones that maybe not all of us enjoy. Um, or, you know, on maybe not the most well-known or most popular characters. But we're going to tell you about old DJ, and we're going to you know, let you decide for yourself. If he's a Whether cool dude. you want it or not, we're talking DJ. Yeah. My goodness. No. So this only very recently became a toy that the three of us all have. Ah. Actually, all we have with us at the moment, which is nothing short of a miracle because, mm. I mean, I might be in Australia, but Paul's house sitting in my folks' place. So, yes. So how, how did you manage that, Paul? I can't I believe we're both house sitting. I have oh. so many talents. Did I say Paul? <laughs> It's 5 a.m. Rob, <laughs> Rob is house sitting my folks' place. Mm -hmm. I'm so used to handing off to Paul first up because you're right I know. There, right there on StreamYard. But That's Rob, usually how, how we do it, but this time how, around we did this time. How around. did it fortuitously occur that, that DJ followed you into the burbs of Cape Town? I chose a bunch of characters that I wanted to bring with. Um, maybe I was, I was hoping to film some stuff. Um, and. Um, yeah, he was in the bag with a bunch of other stuff that... Um, you just happened to be in the bag. You didn't have an actual intention behind DJ. <laughs> no, I, I really didn't, actually. I had no intention to bring him with. But he was in the bag with a lot of other stuff that um, I did showcase um, a while ago that Andrew uh, gave to me um, very kindly, along with all, all the good stuff that comes with all the figures. Um, yeah, and he happened to be in there. Um, so I was very fortunate to have him. So this is one of those rare occasions where... We all have the the figure we're talking about in hand because sometimes, yeah, Stephen's collection is here at his parents' place. And or surprisingly, it's a figure that we. Mom. Surprisingly, it's a figure that's quite um, contentious, and I it's not so. one that I thought we'd all have. To be quite honest with you, I and think Stephen got his by accident. No, it's <laughs> staring me in the face. There's a vintage toy store in the shopping mall that is closest to me here oh, in of Brisbane. Of course, there and is. And it was 25 Australian, which is about 15 US, and I still snubbed it because it wasn't complete. Woo. It was missing the antenna. Um, and well, then <sighs> they reduced it to 20 Australian, which is about 10 US, maybe 12. Um, mm -hmm. And I couldn't say no. I was like, ah, mm -hmm. it's a Joe that I don't have. It's a communication expert. If nothing else, he can have a cameo in a play motion, just like passing Hawk a message. And he totally does. <laughs> I, I have debuted him already in Demons, um, Woo. which is International Backyard 4 for anyone scratching their heads. Um, yeah. Yeah. Happy to have him, I guess. We're going to get into it. Um, but Rob, you put him on a wish list. I One did of our indeed. very kind friends asked G.I. Joburg, what Joes are you what guys are you still guys pining for? And Rob wrote DJ. So I think you need to motivate indeed, I did. more than anyone else. Well, I mean, I think the, the very basic, um, most boring reason why I added him to a list is that he is one of the 1989 figures. Um, famously, I absolutely adore Scoop. He's from 1989. Um, I also um, would have uh, been uh, upping, uh, you know, talking about 1989 for a, a wonderful uh, discussion we were meant to have. I, I missed. Um, I eventually did talk about him in, in 1989 in the episode. Um, that's the, the very most basic thing is that uh, I want to complete 1989 come Hell or High Water come uh, DJ or. You know, DJ Downtown, whoever else is. Uh, not, <laughs> DJ not Downtown. Good. You know, come DJ, come Downtown. I'm going to finish 1989. That's that's my life's mission. Um, otherwise, he just looks interesting and different. Um, I think if you are used to all your you know soldiers being soldier men, he's very very unique. He's very sci-fi, um, and yeah, he kind of because I like sci-fi a lot. Even though I mean, sci-fi isn't the concept of sci-fi. I mean, I do like sci-fi the figure a lot. Um, he does stand out a bit because he, he looks very, very unique, especially at that time in the line. I don't think there were a lot of like out there 
Joes. I mean, obviously, lots of Cobras are very far out there, um, but I think he's out there. And he, I think he complements Scoop very well. The the kind of like the the green and the the green and the the blues on him actually go very well. They contrast very well when you put them together. Um, yeah, you got cameraman and sound guy. I, that's a, there you that's go. a nice pairing. You yeah. just pinged some nostalgia in me, Rob. We used to use GI Joes to play essentially Star Wars games a lot. There was Absolutely. a lot of like space adventures, um, basically going to like starports and cantinas intergalactic mm -hmm. bars and watering holes and like absolutely with this he game dj it. is a perfect denizen for that setting uh it's very denizen, useful I'll, figure in a I side even imagine story. he would even i could even have made him my protagonist i think i think oh, i think he looks man. cool enough to be in an incredibly awesome main character in a sci-fi adventure uh he certainly has a phaser too in fact <laughs> well, we'll get into it. Paulie, you got any uh, first thoughts you'd like to share on your love for DJ? When did you get yours? Jeez, I'm trying to remember now when I got mine. Um, I know that I got mine. Like I bought, I actually bought that. <laughs> we all know you have it. It's in your hands right now. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I put, like I actually got this. I think a local seller actually had this. Um, and I got it with all the attachments. I, I think... Jeez, my memory is really, really bad because I've gotten so many of these damn things. Um, but, Four. Um, How many DJs sorry. do you own? <laughs> but I do rem no, no, not DJs. But I do remember going out of my way to get one because he's a very, very interesting toy. Um, not just if you look at him just from a toy perspective, uh, he's got like that weird connection that goes there, which I just don't keep in him because I'm scared of losing it. He's got the removable antenna. You're talking about this, got the cable. shoulder plug. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, that goes into the feeds into the wire. His gear is very unusual. Uh, in fact, I think um, one of the things that turned me on to this guy back in the day was when we were talking about him possibly being a Battle Force 2000 member um, at one stage. And I, I do oh, remember, he is, sort of like, uh, he is yeah. very much so. When we get to the Falcon, it's weird actually. And um, yeah, there was just there's like little things about this guy, like. The design, I love the design of him. And I love that it, there's just something about this guy that I like, about the toy that I like. I don't really care much for the character, but the toy is really, really cool. Well, I think it's really, really cool. I just well, think it makes you the... care a little bit more about the character hmm. because I think there's a character worth caring about. And it's something kind of refreshing for G.I. Joe, a bunch of like, you know, a type personalities get it done soldiers and all of a sudden you mm. got a professional disc jockey turned soldier let's read his file card anyone want to mm. nominate themselves interesting i'll do it for a change because um, nice. uh, i actually dj okay should i start this with file name okay do it so dj battle force 2000 comtech trooper whatever that Ooh. means <laughs> file name rossi the third thomas r or should i say thomas r rossi the third serial number whole bunch of numbers primary military specialty radio telephone operator secondary military specialty infantry all the way in, no. in brackets okay let, let me yeah. stop you there all the way <laughs> is actually a motto for the oh. 82nd airborne division cool. so this is airborne infantry and arguably the most elite airborne infantry division so okay it's it doesn't say anything about him being airborne infantry on the file card but like if that motto hint is anything to go by maybe he's more elite than we give him credit for so mm, that's that's interesting. an interesting little nugget that google uh, yielded for me and that's the fun can... little easter egg as well anyway yeah both because place, otherwise Providence... why would they say all the way it's like yeah no other gi exactly. joe has that parentheses all the way all the way like you say um, that to your place. superior officer <laughs> apparently you say all the yeah. way and they say airborne anyway please continue okay oh good oh i didn't know that that's actually very cool we all <laughs> learned something today hey for those of you who tuned in to listen to a, a, a chat about dj now you know something um birthplace providence rhode island now the home of hasbro i mean yes i was gonna say isn't that the location yeah. of hasbro Absolutely. and um he's his grade is SB4, so he's a specialist. Cool. Okay, now we get into the fun stuff. DJ was the baddest 
hottest disc jockey in Boston. Boston, cool. Before he signed up for the Battle Force, to, uh, before he signed up for the Battle Force 2000 team, complicated sound equipment was no problem for him. If it is loaded with transistors, portable, and transmits or receives radio ra radio, radio waves, DJ radio can make raves. it work. <laughs> <laughs> DJ can make it work. Fix it and coax strange strange sounds out of it with an infectious beat. What simulated oh, is that useful? <laughs> I I don't know. It's useful if you want to make Wrong. music. If you want to produce Wrong. music, yeah. Like I, I don't know. If you want to have like a side a side hustle of being a DJ while you yeah a soldier, I suppose. or distractions. Well, I guess yeah. he's, he's so good at his job that he can not only like get you to like take a piece of junk equipment and make a transmitter out of it, but he can also like compose on it. So mm -hmm. yeah. He's that good. So I mean, it's like the Tom it's, York it's, of GI Joe. Or well, actually, not the Tom York. He'd be the the Johnny Greenwood. Yeah, John yeah, Greenwood. He'd be the if Johnny you're Greenwood, a Radiohead actually, fan, of uh, cool. of because he can. He seems to be able to play almost anything. <laughs> the music comes out. Also, like <laughs> um, simulated ground wave transmitters and ultra fast burst encoders are complicated pieces of electronic hardware. If you're pinned down in the bush and need a medivac extraction or old-fashioned air support, you're just whistling in the wind if your radio is down for the count. His teammates, can, uh, his teammates can count on DJ to get the message out, even if he has to rebuild the transmitter from parts. Once he's on the air, it's his chatter that they can't that they can do without. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, he's like. Quote. Yeah, but not only once again speaks to his proficiency, but also to the fact that he is a bit of a chatty Cathy. So if you are playing DJ, you need to play him like the smooth disc jockey who's on the mic and like you're listening to the smooth sounds of DJ. I'm coming at you live from Combat Zone Alpha, and we've got some guys pinned down. What if you, you can hear this, that means I did my job right. <laughs> and you know what well. that reminds me of, guys? There's a Transformers analogy to be drawn Ooh. here with blaster yeah ah, just a smooth dude who happens to be fighting a war against the decepticons but like it's not going to stop him from every time he's on the mic like just being a smooth dude good morning yeah. vietnam kind of vibes yeah. it's um, cool that they mentioned boston in there because it's it's unfortunate yes. that he does come out at the time where every single it seems every single G.I. Joe had to have been born in Rhode Island. It's it's kind of like a given that the, at, by this point in time, uh, the Hazard people were like, we need some representation for Rhode Island. Let's make all the Joes come from there now. I think um, those were in-house changes. So whoever wrote the file card, <laughs> potentially Larry, be. had the Boston setting, and then like Hasbro so stepped in. Maybe it was... I think, yeah, but Kirk Bazigian was not on G.I. Joe at this period of the line. Mm -hmm. So someone else was just mandating that all these Joes come from Pawtucket. I wonder, yeah. I mean, is there like a, I mean, is there history to pop Boston being connected to music? Um, yes. Oh, ah. well, so. Yes, yeah. please so speak to that. Boston, okay, so the cool thing about Boston is uh, it is a music town, actually. And but it's quite popular in the electronic music scene, especially for America. Um, and a lot of your sort of alt and indie bands actually come out of Boston. Boston is um, like where, how do I put it? If um, if you think about like uh, like one of my favorite bands, and it's a shout out to this awesome band, they're called Freeze Pop. And they've done a lot of like music for games and for TV shows and all kinds of stuff as well. But they're like super geeky as well. And they hail from Boston. And they, you know, like there's a lot of roots for electronic music in Boston. So I, I feel like if he was a rocker, him being connected to Boston, maybe not so much. But because he's an electronic musician, like, you know, Boston is kind of significant for that. And that is really cool. I dig that. You know, because uh, Boston also has a, a bit of a, also a bit of a funk history, if I'm not mistaken, as well. So mm. yeah, Boston's significant for music, which is cool. It's we play cool. all There's kinds. There's also something called play all kinds. Yeah. Hell Guys, yeah. do you sometimes feel like this figure, like 
do you some uh, I'm gonna just say DJ instead of just referring to the toy, but do you sometimes feel like he doesn't belong in G.I. Joe like his design? Like maybe he was considered for something else. I don't know. It's just there's always been something about his design that makes me think he should have been for something else. And that yeah, was I know. I would I would probably agree with that. I mean, even if you kind of compare him to the rest of the Battle Force two thousand, um, I think he does stand out even against that grouping. And it's also mm. weird that he he doesn't come out at the same, you know, like with them. Because, I mean, those all guys, I mean, if, if you know, correct me if I'm wrong, they all came with vehicles. Um, no, but they came two years before DJ. Yeah. yeah. Okay, they yeah, weird, they, that's why it's weird. weird like, you know? moment in Hasbro marketing where they decide to give you vehicleless or driverless vehicles, but give them assigned drivers that you had to buy separately. Yeah, but it's it's just interesting that two years before all of Battle Force 2000 came out, and then there's kind of like this this outlier. It's like, oh, by the way, here's another Battle Force 2000 guy. Uh, we forgot to bring him out with the rest of the guys, I guess. So, <laughs> and yet, you know, yeah, 1989 did yield one additional Battle Force 2000 vehicle, but <sighs> I don't think DJ's in any of the like promotional material around it. He's not on the box yeah. art of the pulverizer. That honor goes mm-hmm. to recoil. And I can distinctly recall a catalog shot of the pulverizer with scoop in it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It, yes, I mean, yeah. He seems to not be associated with the vehicle in any way. There's no mention of it on the file card because all the other Battle Force 2000 guys, for their sort of sub subtitle, basically beneath their code name, it would say Eliminator Driver. Or dominator driver, um, yeah. vector pilot, but in the case of DJ, he's just com tech trooper. So he's perfect for riding bitch on um, Dodger's vehicle, <laughs> <laughs> the Eliminator. Let's take a look at his first, last, and only comic book appearance. Comic appearance. Oh, goodness. Yeah, we've got to do it. Happy medicine, boys. Issue one one three of GI Joe, entitled Previous Agreement largely focuses on Stalker and his team being pinned down at a Porsche dealership in the Emirate of Benzene. This Mm. is the issue that kills off Sneak Peek the first time. But (laughs) almost as an afterthought, the Battle Force 2000 are rolling up to provide relief for Stalker's team. They've got all their members and all their toys. They've got all the vehicles, all the members of the 1987 squad plus DJ. He's in the back of, I think it's the Eliminator. It's the bike. <laughs> um, or sort of half-track bike that Dodger commands. He thankfully and... has words to say, although the few words he does say, he's very serious more than uh, playing towards however he was established in the file card. Yeah, well, it's, it's a serious like situation. I think, like, yeah, like if I maybe he had down. a bit more page time, we'd see a bit more levity out of him. But the very mm. next appearance we see of Battle Force 2000, the <laughs> oil fields that, that they're driving through and flying through, I always wondered why the Vector somehow got caught in the splatter. Um, they're the, flying through this refinery. Fireball. Cobra Commander has an <laughs> artillery strike ordered on it, and boom, the whole thing goes up. Oh, apologies. The, the half-track bike is name-checked on the page. It's called the Marauder. Mm. You can tell that I don't collect BF2K vehicles, guys. At least not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so Dodger's driving out of the flames and smoke, calling out to his teammates. Is there anyone there? Main, uh, Maverick, Knockdown, Avalanche, Blocker, Blaster. They don't answer. DJ, see if you can raise them on the command net. Because as I said, DJ is riding bitch. And he turns around and he's like, DJ, not him too. And we don't see any wounds or anything, but DJ is quite clearly dead. Yeah. He's he's sleeping, (laughs) snapping. Yeah, he does. (laughs) Having a little nap, a little bit of smoke inhalation. He'll be fine in half an hour. Um, But yeah, that is is the moment of his passing. That's it. It's unfortunate. I mean, mm. it, it just begs so many questions, man. Like, why like what happened what is the story behind this toy like was he made for gi joe was he not made for gi joe was he made by a creator that worked at hasbro that maybe they had a huge falling out with or something 
and then you know some ceo or some body that was in charge was like ah oh, screw this was he the victim of like a change of god you know like where the new guy came in and it was like all the old guy stuff is crap and just like turfed it all out and it was just like kill this character off immediately we don't want to do anything was there like a focus group that like saw this and went like mm, eh, that's i'm like gonna i'm gonna hazard something. a guess and this is purely a guess but you just yeah. pinged it in my mind that maybe there was going to be a second series of BF2K, BF2K guys in 1988 and someone mm, had gone yeah. very far into the design work of the first character, that was DJ, before mm. Hasbro pulled the plug because of poor sales. But so much work had been done on this first mm. guy that they decided, well, let's make him fill a slot in 1989 series. Yeah, because, I mean, if you look at the rest of the lineup, I mean, I'm... I'm not going to say that the lineup for 1989 is an oddball bunch, um, but he definitely doesn't fit in with the other Joes that come out this year. I mean, yes, there's Countdown, mm. he's a you know astronaut, and then DJ is a communications guy. You have um, a version two of Deep Six, um, you know, a water guy, and the mm. other guys kind of seem generally, I suppose, like urban, typically, you know, with version three of Snake Eyes, and of course, then um, sort of stalker, uh, outdoor stalker. stalker. Um, yeah. So they're kind of all over the place, but they still kind an of you still kind of see them. Yeah, an astronaut, but you can still kind of see them gelling together generally. They can kind of make a team of four, maybe five Joes there. They can kind of go on missions together. Um, but he really is an outlier um, amongst the, the, the other Joes that came out that year. And unfortunately, he couldn't be featured more in comics. I think just seeing the file card and, and kind of describing him as such like a chatty dude, um, it would have been cool to kind of see him more in, you know, like maybe a special missions uh, comic where you could actually feature him and his abilities and what he could do more than what, unfortunately, he was yeah. given in the comics. Talking about Talking. Countdown, though, um, oh. the Crusader shuttle was released in 1989, which is the pared down, yeah, just the shuttlecraft of the Defiant. Now, mm -hmm. there are three seats in the main cabin. Ooh. Halo's going to occupy the, the captain's chair. Of course. Countdown's going to be in the second chair. He is your natural third choice for like the communications and navigation station. I, I think that makes totally. sense. And yeah. his aesthetic works. Yeah. Mm. Go Very much so. Too bad he's dead. <laughs> also, <laughs> he was um, resurrected though. He was resurrected ever so slightly. Oh, yeah? Fun ah. Publications, who organized Jocon uh, in 2017, they featured him in a comic book that they published. Uh, issue 10 of their G.I. Joe versus Cobra sort of convention exclusives. This is from 2017, the year before we oh, went, fantastic. unfortunately. But I mean, I, I don't know if you guys recall when we went to Jocon yeah. 2018, there's a whole bunch of like convention sets and vehicles yes. uh, for sale from the previous year. Yeah. We were yeah. like, wow, I've never seen this stuff before. This is cool. A conquest yeah. that's done up to be like a Battle Force 2000 jet, a, snow, um, a bo polar battle bear that's silver. Ooh. How nice. Anyway, he's not on the cover of that issue. They just went with the original six 1987 boys. However, on the inside, we see it's a story where Dodge has been captured and is being interrogated, and he goes into a big old flashback. Or is it Knockdown? No, it's Dodger. It can't mm. be Knockdown. Knockdown's dead. Um, yeah, he goes into a flashback, and in the flashback, we see a resurrected... Or DJ. memory, I suppose, a memory of the BF2K, and DJ's in the mix. Well, they're suspiciously so white. They didn't leave him out. Sorry, just just a small like detail, but he looks very white in the flashback. <laughs> this is an uh, African might be man. The quality of the scan that I've got on the screen. It could be, it could be, it could be, but he is he's quite obviously, you know, African American. Um, when you look at the character, the on his uh, the picture on the file card, and you look at the actual figure itself. Yeah, that I can buy that important. for now. I'm just it was just like a just, so we I actually think get some lines. It's from the it. art style. It's the art style. You know, mm -hmm. it's very washed out. The 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 colors and the the frames in this in this comic book, at least from what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. It is yep, very he's got a line. White white. Roger says, "DJ Squawk again." to give them our position, static, not voice. And DJ says, Roger that, Top. Anyone listening won't know it from background noise. And then he gets a little bit characteristic. He says, just like comparing bubblegum pop and hip hop bass lines. 
What? Ooh, I don't understand that. Mm. Like, but anyway, you don't know enough about electronic music, I guess. <laughs> Clearly, yeah, no. there's a probably music styles from the time. I kind of, I kind of find that DJ's annoying personality might stem more from. Um, actually, let me ask you guys this as a question: Did any of you guys ever have a friend? Um, or just an acquaintance in your friends group or something that was like trying to do the whole beatboxing thing with their mouth and or like trying to do the whole Roselle thing. I don't know if you guys know who Roselle is, but Roselle does I like did a once of... go to a high school and there were some wannabe hip hop stars trying to emerge so, at very so I imagine so I imagine he's one of those dudes that like sits there and he's like he'll talk and he'll be like <laughs> <laughs> it's like so I, I would imagine that's like quite grating but, but maybe that also good at it, or is he quite amateurish yo maybe he is good at it and maybe it's also like a compulsion for him as well because you know that th they do sort of post him as a bit of a i don't want to say genius but as a, a bit of a savant when it comes to being able to mix frequencies and fix radio equipment and technical stuff so he might mm. have a bit of a like a a, a quirk to his personality, yeah, a bit of a tick where he's like always like in his, you know, he's in his Joe's vibe. Answer to Metalhead, then Metalhead yes. just he has to say bang, bang. <laughs> <laughs> I actually love well, that like, about DJ, Metalhead. I DJ love that like, characterization. He's going full yeah. auto on his ray gun. He's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. Like, why yeah, he's, lame, that's why, exactly why it. Beatbox skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, whatever, man. Like, it's all good. Trust me. Like, but like, like, I think he was just that personality. And and by the way, to everybody that was like practicing to be a beatboxer and whatever, if you've managed to make a career out of it or something, go go you. Just know that you annoyed the shit out of your friends when you were younger. <laughs> and I think DJ is just like that. Um, but I I, I know normally we like we'd be able to go into some cartoon appearances with this guy and you know we've just gone into the very brief comic book appearances of DJ but still got a few minutes left on this thing and something that I would like to do that we don't really really do too much on these episodes is I want to talk about the actual sculpt um, yeah. which I personally find quite fascinating because it deals with a lot of uh, textural elements and it's got a lot of um, like to me it's got like a lot of eye candy in a weird way like i know people are very dismissive of this but one of the things that drew me to this figure is how interesting it actually is when you look at his parts um like for example i love the um i love the rubbery kind of uh coiled pattern that is around his legs uh that gray pattern it looks so so cool and they've done it it's very like I know it's not something unusual for a GI Joe figure, but there is an a, but the way that they've executed it is pretty like streamlined. It's quite slick actually, um, which I really dig. Um, and also the little side arm being on the left hand side, and it's got like a. It's not a modern weapon. It's definitely some kind of a ray gun kind of vibe. That, that got yeah, I'm there. sure that goes in with the aesthetic of his um his general aesthetic. Take your hmm. pick of Star Trek phases. I'm going to go with the one in the middle. It yeah. is very much inspired by phases. I would absolutely agree with that. You For those see? of you guys listening to the podcast, I'm bringing up an image of all the classic Star Trek and Next Generation um, and beyond, I think, phases. <clears throat> and yeah, there's definitely a swoopy one that has a sloping like sort of back section. It's the one that you plug in the little like like remote control style phaser into the top. Yeah, I think you would often yes. have seen that in either uh, probably the movies, like the, yes, the original yeah. cast movies. The original I cast movies. Those. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. He's got Jinx. some great details for sure. Yeah. Is he um, wearing denim, guys? Do you imagine those blue pants to be jeans? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, I think yeah. it could be, yeah. And he's bloused them into these like galoshes basically these gray yeah ribbed thank you tube yeah it kind of pulls those up over that well if we sure. are talking about the lower half of him we mm. gotta address it it's time boys yeah the boots Woof. the, the boots. Boots. <laughs> His most infamous aspect even the most casual appraisers of gi joe figures can't look past these boots 
it turned me off for the longest time. I'm like, I, I just don't understand it. It's a they fashion are thing, yeah? very unique. I don't think you can you will find another G.I. Joe that has shoes that look anything like what White Joe's wearing. Boots. They're wild. I mean, Go I think away. we were I, I don't know if Stephen was, we mentioned this on air in in 333, but I mean we were um you know wondering like are there high heels? As in like do his feet <laughs> arch you know completely up to the the slope? And then, you know, kind of like his feet go up like that at an angle or mm -hmm. are his feet down, like, you know, normal shoes. And then it just has these absolutely insane, like lifty parts that are just like kind of like high above his feet. And if they are heels, does that make DJ out to be canonically the shortest G.I. Joe figure? Yeah, because, because if he's you lower his feet G.I. Joe's down. height with heels. <clears throat> Take those mm -hmm. heels off and he's a short crazy. round. It's crazy so, to think about. And, and again, I want a bit of detail oh. on the cuff. They're kind of yes. beaded. Like mm -hmm. you could always imagine those being like rhinestones or maybe like <laughs> metal studs or something. <laughs> yeah. So that is an int like, so, okay. So I've got two theories for that. The one theory is that a lot of his design cues were taken from a uh, sort of like neo futurism from the eighties like that would mm -hmm. appear in like conceptual art by guys like Ron Cobb and Sid Mead, et cetera. Um, and I think some of these design aesthetics were borrowed from that, or maybe even from the, the great stars of fashion of the eighties may have had these visions of the, uh, of the future and, and th uh, considered like these boots and, and all that. And the reason I say that is because if you watch, um, the fifth element, uh, you know, those designs were done by Jean Paul Gaultier and, mm -hmm. um, and, he, uh, some of that stuff resonates like DJ's design resonates with some of the fashion that's in the fifth element, which is also a neo futurist kind of style of fashion from the eighties. Um, because that was very like, you know, avant garde. So there's that side of it. Um, then the other side of it, I think maybe when this guy was being designed, they thought, okay, well, he's a sound specialist. So maybe what he likes to do is, and you guys will know anybody who's worn headphones or headsets or whatever will know that if you go running or whatever's with your headset uh you'll hear your music but you'll also almost you'll hear the impact of hitting the ground through your body in your ears and in, in your i don't know if you guys get that but i get that i can hear sure that kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah so okay good so we're all human check okay <laughs> so um i think what maybe what was considered here was that if you look at some of the ribbing even on the gloves and if you look at the boots maybe they were designed to absorb shock so that it wouldn't interfere with frequencies uh that he would be picking up uh mid battle wow. or in, in in the throes of things to help him isolate um communic uh, like enemy freak like enemy communications and stuff so that was a thought that i had as well with him I don't know how much of that is true, but there's just something about the, the toys design that communicates that with me. Well, like, yeah, um, I mean, I can imagine, I mean, that, yeah, it could, it could muffle either the sounds from his own body or sounds around him to make it easier to kind yes. of like, uh, actually hyper focus, whatever he's trying to do to get the actual, the perfect tuning of whatever equipment he's yes. working on. I mean, the, the one detail though of the figure that I find very weird is that his butt kind of had this weird concave thing that's going on. <laughs> In the middle there it's not as bad as like say um a bat um but it's it's weird he's <laughs> he got really bat does ass. have this kind of like it, it I, I don't know i have never considered this action figures but but rob it really is you're right look he's at it bat it's, ass. it's very strange um look, i mean other there, are, from... there are different kinds of butts in gi joe Mm -hmm. So the, I'm glad the sculptors brought that out in DJ. Yeah, I and just to cap off the boots though. Yeah, there is concept art of this figure, Dave Dorman's American Hero book. Um, oh yes. And now that this is screens that I, that I grabbed from Form BX two five seven's review of DJ, and I think mm. between us and him, we're going to be the only channels that ever review this guy. <laughs> the challenge goes out to you guys. Any other? G.I. Joe toy reviewers out there. But, um, Can you say yeah. something we haven't? <laughs> <laughs> Form BX257 brings up the book, and the boots are far more conventional in Dave's artwork. 
Ah, so maybe this was a sculpting issue. <laughs> it could be that they struggled to get the yeah the fabrics uh, to kind of fall in a certain way when it comes to the boots. Yeah. yeah. Someone had an idea and they ran downhill with it. Whoever was on and the nobody stopped them. The time. Yeah, exactly. I mean, other great details and on the figure are his his uh, you know his crotch area is very, very silvery. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like also also very ribbed as well. Um, and if you're wondering, the silver does kind of extend to, to the end of the little bit there, um, in between. Rob, I'm curious. Can you get your elbows into a 90 degree bend? Because we're currently looking at a picture of your, uh, your DJ mm. on the screen. And um, when I got mine, I immediately test out all the articulation. Yeah, I put same. the elbows into a 90 degree, and because he has painted green on his forearms. Mm. My paint immediately scraped away as I pushed the joint. Oh, fascinating. Interesting. Well, nothing I... stops me from doing it. Um, I, I, I definitely can kind right of. Now. So I've Let got little look. white, like, absent paint marks. I can definitely push them paint. all away. Mm. Um, yeah, the only detailing on mine that is is a bit scuffed um, is actually his his nose. Um, it's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> he is Quite missing a, a little bit of a, of coloring around his nose. Well, there. you know those He's DJs, kind of... man. They they live fast. Um, <laughs> they're banging those rails. <laughs> um, and the, in the image no, I'm showing now, you also get to see the kind of like the little bits of like electronic detailing on his chest as well. Uh, you continue to have. Oh, the mine's kind of cool, man. Ribbed, um, the the ribbing that you see on the the, yes. the gloves and the and the uh on the boots but it also goes across the chest and above that you get these cool little detail electronic details picked out in silver mm. which, which so I, you say I yours really doesn't have like. a nose rub paul i guess yours your your dj just says no while no. rob's dj <laughs> loves candy just guy, says i you know, want more let's do it off my crotch piece <laughs> my, my guy's music is just more hardcore i guess he does know, have these really gutters beats. on the crotch piece <laughs> right yes <laughs> yeah Pretty well engineered for lines. This is uh, so what are like YouTube. What are they talking about? Yeah, <laughs> I think um, I think one of the sad things about this guy, uh, just design wise, and uh, and I think this is very much a personal thing for me. I think it would have been way more interesting to have had the face shield with the red, what what looks like a visor. I would have loved mm -hmm. that ovaries face, like instead of the the glasses, the silver glasses. I somehow think that would have made him look cooler and more um, like I think it would have made him more redeemable in the eyes of, of others. But for some reason, I think just him having these like he's got like a cyclist vibe going here. OK, <laughs> he's like, yeah, he kind of does have the kind of, like, helmet on there and the little bits are on mm. the sides kind of just attached there, essentially. It, is, it's a, it is interesting. It's it different. is interesting. <laughs> It's a cool. I I actually do like the design. I just think the sculpt doesn't help it out so much. But I think it's a good design overall. Yeah, occasionally um, I think I think the sculpt mm. does kind of fight. I mean, I still think the most uh, the weirdest thing about the figure is the 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 fact that they decided to include a pipe, um, and the pipe has little white right. ends to it, and the fact that yes. that you you have to decide whether you want to have those stuck into the figure. Um, on its left shoulder and in the back of its head, or if you want those to stay attached to the ca on, to the um, to the pipe itself, mm. I think because it's, it's just interesting that they can come out and go in. It's like I don't quite understand why they made that decision. It's like why not just have it stay where it was? You know, I mean, most other figures don't have that kind of feature, as it were, where the it could have been a play feature. Perhaps. Um, let, me, let me expand on that. It could have been a play feature that was meant to marry with a, a, a like a specified kind of vehicle or or accessory mm. that would come out that w never was released. Um, that's that's what that's the only thing I can think of because why? Like you asking now, why do that? So many other GI Joe figures have just got poles sticking out of them. Uh, you yeah. know, like um, it's weird, Night and Vice it doesn't even example. attach to yeah. the backpack. You know, yeah. Um, like the the included backpack doesn't have anything inside it that kind of like suggests that you know it should it should attach to you know what what he's got going on there. Um, 
Yeah. Oof. One of the most and interesting things. Pieces. Yeah. So I'm actually wondering now. So Stephen, you say yours, you did yours didn't come with the antenna. Nope. So you don't have an antenna. Paul, did yours come with your antenna or did you have to replace yes. it? If, uh, if, no, if and you're watching this, this, you'll see that mine's got the antenna. And I've got the little white piece as well um, that actually has Prestic on it as well. From the Ah, well, mine actually yeah. fits quite nicely. Um, so even though mine, this isn't an original, Andrew was, was kind enough, um, where we found this version, actually came with a repro. So oh, this is a repro brilliant. made by oh, the War Lens, um, by the War Lens. Uh, they're on Instagram, I believe, and they have their own website as well, um, thewarlands.com. The and I believe they, yeah. I, I, I'd assume they produce a lot of reproduction stuff for GI Joe. Uh, they kind of have like a few examples on their, uh, on their kind of like the included. Warlands. The, the Warlands, yeah. So mine is actually the a Warlands. reproduction. <laughs> I'm wanting to now offer a consideration of how he was packaged originally. I think mm. that could be an interesting take take away from this. Um, the fact that like the the antenna was in a separate portion on this image, courtesy of 3D Joe's. They've got a carded ah. version, and this is how I remember DJ best because he was an absolute peg warmer in the stores <laughs> around me. Um, <laughs> so yes, carded DJ. Though on the South African card, we didn't have the Battle Force 2000 logo he was just mm -hmm. it was just a gi joe card we would not we have didn't have that. much battle force 2000 reference by the time we got these figures anyway blink and you miss it but the antenna is in the top portion with his gun and with his hose the plug points the white plug points are actually stuck into the hose yes and you can see right behind there there's the antenna now as these things age and as the adhesive wears out on these many many carded djs out in the world no doubt that gap will start to widen and <laughs> it's very potential that that first thing will fall out it'll drop it'll drop into the lower mm. section of the card where his back is stored or maybe yeah. into the, the portion that the figure is stored in and there's that little air hole right at the bottom mm. friends let me tell you I have bought a carded bulletproof just to make sure I got his mic and that mic vanished. It was not in the card oh, at all. I rattled goodness. that card upside down. I could not find it for the life of me. So that just adds credence to the fact that like, as I say, as the adhesive starts to release, these smaller accessories just drop right out onto the floor you don't yeah. even know and you think you're getting unless yourself you've sealed... had your CG seed, uh, you know, in, in like a plastic case. Is actually around the entire file card, you know, kind of like how they do with comic books. There's probably going to be, yeah, hundreds of buying sealed on parts. card action figures is mm. no guarantee that the small parts will be there. Yeah, That's all I'm saying. Mm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, if the like the world couldn't get more cruel. <laughs> Since um, mine doesn't have both of its plug points, I am going to go to a hardware store. I meant to do it in preparation for this episode, but I'm going to go to a yeah. hardware store and try and find a flexible bit of tubing, ribbed tubing, perhaps maybe electronic, um, like sheath uh, for mm -hmm. wiring. Just if I can find something flexible and small enough to run between his helmet and his shoulder to yeah, replicate. Then yours would replicate, would actually match the what's on the file code much better. And also, oh, I mean, and I'm going to drill looking... a hole in his head and have the um, antenna stick out of it. <laughs> while we're looking at the file card, if, if you scroll down to his feet, the, the card feet art. even on, on, on the card art is actually uh, more in line with the original. I mean, we can't see the entire image, um, but they are more in line with the promo images or the, um, the prototype images than they are actually with the figure, the figure themselves. And did you sure. get more detailing there on, on the kind of like how the boot is attached? Um, it's almost like he is a space guy because if looking at the art on the card, it's kind of like sealed. You know, it it's, it mm. kind of feels like the um, sections of a an astronaut um, uh, you know, suit. Actually, you know, it's kind of like sealed um, where where it kind of attaches to his jeans and where it attaches to his boots. So I mean, you you kind of if you fill that helmet in, and then suddenly is actually another astronaut, which I think actually does lend credence to him, you know, being able to be on the Crusader. 
Mm. But you can't do it without doing a head swap, basically. Or yeah. just yeah. stick some putty over his mouth. <laughs> he would have totally done that as kids, by the way. Oh, um, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We've spoken, about yes. the, we've spoken about the antenna. Let's talk about the gun and the backpack. Yes, let's have a look at the MR. gun and, and mm. the backpack. So a if very memory cool serves, gun. Rob hates this gun. <laughs> Well, it's as memory it's serve, an you want to use it as like a then. plot device, Paul. Like this is like some kind of like experimental technology that needs to be stolen or traded or yes. Oh, I'm envious yes. of your plugs, Rob. Yeah, Sorry. they're actually quite um, nice. Um, before we get yeah. there, yes, mine they are actually still the cam attached to the the, the things themselves, the the, the tubing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, we, when I do attach them to the figure. It's more often than not the the tube itself will come out first before um, the plugs will. So if you don't, if you want your figure to have the plugs out, um, yeah, you're gonna have to struggle to actually get those little plugs out again. Um, so that's what I find whenever I kind of like complete my figure. Um, mine is which glued is why in. I found it interesting. Oh, is yours glued yeah. in? Yeah, okay. somebody glued mine in. Yeah. Which I think is, I mean, it feels like the natural way of doing it. It's like, why would he have come with them separate, you know? Yeah. It almost feels, it feels like he was meant to come with a different type of tubing, or as you suggested earlier, that he was meant to attach to something else uh, rather than mm. to himself. Um, so, yeah, it's you just know, kind of cool that, yeah, he does come with those sort of things. I Listen, I've always liked the gun. I think um I think I made that quite clear on the one podcast episode, but I'm gonna you know reiterate that here. I like this gun. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. Um, it once again kind of feels out of place for GI Joe, even by GI Joe futuristic standards. Well, it kind of um, feels out of place yeah. at the time that it came out. I think it kind of feels yes. it feels like it's something that you would see later on in, in the series, especially on the um weapon trees that you get in the 90s it feels like yes. one of those sorts yeah. of guns like the prototype or something they do later on um it's, yeah. it's certainly a unique gun you, you will not find a gun like this with any other joe yeah so and, he comes with a red laser rifle for anyone who's uh, that's uh, if you're wondering what it looks like and it's and it looks a bit like a batleth <laughs> yes there's a klingon aesthetic to it it's very swoopy yeah. it's got mm -hmm. a lot of points on it the grip has a point at its tip. The trigger guard is pointed. The foregrip is pointed. The mm. back end is pointed. It's a very pointy gun. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine hitting gun. someone with it and having it being very effective to do that with. And can I just say that the gun and DJ's shining moment in all G.I. Joe lore, for me at least, will forever be his appearance on the cover of the 1991 european catalog which Ooh. i'm going to share if it's in the right spot no it's not oh there it is haha <laughs> yes this catalog shot features gi joe on the one side represented by rock and roll and dj Both squaring off against an alley viper and a frag viper frag also viper 89. and alley viper are taking cover behind a hiss too while not rock and roll, but DJ is returning fire with that red thing. It seems mm -hmm. to be firing out of the top and the bottom. It's it's firing. It's, it's quite impressive, whatever it's firing. And it's, I mean, it, rock and roll's like, okay, you got this, DJ. Yeah, I want to look at my gun. <laughs> I'm not going to bother. Uh, you I love the way that... that <laughs> if you, um, for, for those of you listening to the podcast... Uh, you guys, please go and check out this catalog, the the Euro catalog. Yeah, Not check out the catalog. Go check out our um, episode on YouTube. Um, we didn't. Yes, uh, but uh, you know, about it. But I'm sure that you got. Yeah, exactly. Check out our YouTube series there. But the reason I'm I'm asking you to do that is because I think that artwork of DJ is one of the redeeming, uh, as one of the the things that redeems DJ, at least in my eyes, because I I love this artwork. It's kind of a nostalgic thing, and it just makes him look really cool and it helps you sort of divorce yourself of any like misconceptions you may have already or preconceptions you may have of this toy already. Um, so I just thought that was worth mentioning, but guys, you know what we're not mentioning is these really interesting and very weird 
backpack? It is it is an absolutely wild backpack, actually. Um, it's some sort of, I don't know, how do you describe it? It's a giant blue uh, dildo. It's like a suppository. <laughs> I was going to say, it's like a suppository with speakers on it. <laughs> and very um, well detailed. Yeah. And what does it do? I mean, all I can imagine that it that it does is it makes a lot of noise. Again, we got that the sort of round, tubular kind of uh, ribs on it. Yeah, it continues uh, which, through that um, design choice. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if well, that's meant while to, there's like, nothing on the file card to suggest that he builds his own weapons. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that he builds his own sound equipment. So this is yeah, yeah, quite possibly like. DJ's very own proprietary Comtech gear that he's cobbled yeah. together out of parts using his savant level intellect um, and you know ge sure. genius ability when it comes to transistors and sound producing equipment and transmitters. Um, so we're seeing the evidence of his work. It just happens to look like a sex toy. <laughs> so something I, I and this is actually why I brought up the backpack because. I've got an idea of how this works or what this could how this could function. So mm -hmm. in the Gundam series, in, in one of the Gundam OVA's eighth mobile suit team, uh, we deal with a lot of the skirmishes that happen on, on Earth, not so much in space. And uh, in the Gundam universe, there's no such thing as radar anymore because uh, there's a power supply that gives off something called Minovsky particles and those destroy radio waves. Um, and so it's very difficult for you to use a radar to to position you know to get positioning on on you know your enemy and whatever and so what they do is they have these tanks that uh, are basically listening stations where they shoot a, a pole into the ground and they can pick up tiny vibrations and they get a you know there's an operator that listens to those vibrations you know and can actually and can actually distinguish uh, between different models of of mobile suits and even to the extent of knowing if the mobile suits are a bit damaged or whatever, and he can, uh, they can actually tell how far they are. So I wonder if this pack, uh, this backpack of DJs, serves a, a similar kind of function. So it's almost like he's like a walking, like they call it Comtech, and they they sort of boil him down to being a communications guy. But I wonder if he's not perhaps a human sonar, so to speak, or a human radar station, and that he can. His technology can pick up sound waves and vibrations and stuff that he can that that somehow like distills it into into some kind of data or processes it into some kind of data that he can say, oh guys, we got like three his tanks coming, you know, 180 degrees moving at you know, uh, 80 kilometers an hour. Uh, you should get visual uh, visual soon, you know. And he can relay that because that helps you know keep communication and information of the battlefield there. So. In that respect, um, this is how I, this is what I've theorized because he has to be different from Psycart, you know, because mm. we've spoken about how Psycart's um, technology could possibly be designed to like, you know, scramble people's brainwaves and things like that, or create weird sounds and whatever. But I think this is more a case of creating, like picking up on the sounds in the environment, and then also purposefully putting out a sound that is similar to, in frequency to that to cancel um, to cancel out their movements. So essentially on radar and stuff, maybe they can even go invisible or not necessarily radar, but you get what I'm saying. Like, you know, because interesting phenomenon about frequencies, uh, and this is from DJing, if you have the same frequency uh, playing together, they'll actually cancel each other out. So you'll actually get like a sort of a dead a dead version of of that frequency so that's how noise cancelling headphones work they mm. take the sound from the outside and then they match it it's and the they opposite. they yeah. they yeah they they match the frequency and that's what blocks out the un or the unwanted noise should i say and lets through the wanted noise so yeah i think this is what this was what this was is some kind of you know system like that but anyway that's a theory yeah. yeah that's it's a great that's me theory. overthinking it <laughs> <laughs> but like we, we've been singing the praises of this figure but i think one of the things um that uh, i don't know if, if you've tried standing this guy up he's not oh my word um 
Such because, a pain. Because, because of the fact that he has these kind of booties, um, yes. they come to a point. So the minute you're not trying to stand him perfectly flat and you're trying to sort of do a pose that requires one foot down and then maybe the, the other foot kind of doing a point, you're going to struggle so hard to kind of get oh, him yeah. to stand up properly. Um, if you are watching the YouTubes, a lot of the images I'm sharing now, I, I took as quickly as I could, um, which is why they might be a little Before bit blurry over. because he, he is such a struggle. Um, and we, I mean, we certainly aren't people that they kind of like, you know, kind of rely on battle bases to kind of like, you know, plop the characters down on. Um, we we kind of like to be able to freehand these things a lot of the time. <laughs> yeah, mostly um, because I'm lazy. I also prefer to just try to freehand it. So yeah. Yeah, um, and yeah, he's it's very difficult to get him in really cool poses, especially with all his equipment, because he, his backpack mm. is super large. Um, yeah, and having it be so big as well, I don't know if you guys have this problem with the backpack. It sticks out super far from his back. Yes, you can't put it the whole way in. It's weird. Like it's, you know, I mean, I know this has happened with, with with several other um figures. I mean, you know, where it, where it go, you know, you kind of put the backpack with with um a figure that the backpack didn't come with and it won't fit in properly. But the hole yeah, in his right. back is very small, like compared to other yeah. JoJo's. Um, and it's just weird that the included backpack does not fit him properly. Um, so yeah, that is unfortunate. It is a weird one. Because it does my, not look nice on him. Like my that. my biggest issue with uh, DJ as a figure actually um, is not is not the boots, even though they are weird as all hell. Um, I can't stand the human part of his face sculpt. Uh, but let me elaborate. Let me expand. From certain angles, uh, it looks fantastic. Like it really works. He looks good. But a lot of the time, when I'm trying to take photos of him, uh, in fact, actually, for in preparation of, uh, of for this episode, I was trying to get some photos with some like interesting lighting and stuff going on, and it just makes it look like there's a really old gentleman uh, wearing that <laughs> helmet, and it, it um, yeah, it's just it's an issue for me, man. I just I really don't love that. Now I am being nitpicky here. Uh, because for the most part, everything else I think is a win, and you know, different like I said, different angles provide um, different solutions, and it looks cool. But yeah, his face sculpt has always bugged me, and also I'm going to say this, and and, and I mean this, of course, with uh, all due respect, but I also feel like his face sculpt, even though he is an African man, an African male, um, I still I feel like he was sculpted as a white guy. The, mm. the actual face sculpt was sculpted as a white guy because uh, he doesn't have features that I feel are typically uh, African. You know, if you look at the character, if you look at Stalker's um, face sculpt, you know, he looks like a black guy. He looks like an African man. You know, if yeah. you look at, um, you know, if you look at most of your characters, the fridge, all of them, they just have like these great face sculpts. And DJ just seems that like a white guy that's been painted, you know, as a black guy. Yeah. So, well, I mean, quite literally yeah. in this case, because I mean, if, 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 if you, you know, if you can tell anything by the fact that the, the nose of mine is kind of like, uh, you know, rubbing away to be white, his head is white paint and they kind of just added, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, they just added to the skin tone on top of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. That is unfortunate. They kind of didn't, um, sculpt him to be what they would have, um, what he, what he seems to be. Yeah, it is it, it just it doesn't feel like his ethnicity is uh, correctly represented. And I mean yeah. it's not this is not this is not like a fault of, of like skill or anything like that, you know. G.I. Joe has got so many has got quite a wide range of ethnicities, you know, uh, Asian, African American, um, Native American, you Red know, like just to name uh, <laughs> redheads, yeah, they're they're species unto themselves. No, but <laughs> Uh, well, no species, ethnicity unto themselves. Sorry, I didn't mean it like <laughs> that, guys. But, you know, you've got a wide range of eth ethnicities in G.I. Joe, and they're all sculpted very well um, to the point where if you took Stalker, Stalker's head and you painted him white, it, it would, would look, look wrong. Yeah. Or you can even tell, wrong. you know, standing like Scooping, yeah. he's got the kind of like curly hair. You can almost say he's Irish yes. in a way as well. I think you can kind yes. of tell the lineage. You of the guys character. are still talking about DJ? I've just yes, made 
made breakfast for my son and <laughs> we're still in this chat. There now, is a lot to say. So much love. Um, there is absolutely is certainly a lot to say. Um, yeah, so difficult to <laughs> photograph, as I, as I said earlier. Um, very difficult to photograph. Um, but what I will say, um, he looks great on a glider. He, <laughs> he also looks great in an MCC as well. And, and I, um, because of his um, sidearm being on the left, I make him southpaw. And yes. that's, oh, fascinating. That's born out by that catalog shot from yes. the 1990s. Oh, and, and the definitely. package art. And the well, package I like to give him give him his main gun, his right hand, so he's still able to pull the ha you know on the, the left hand. With his left. Yeah. You know, so when this runs out, he can you can still reach for that one. You know, he's not. Yeah, he's he doesn't have to weapon. drop the. He doesn't have to drop his main main gun to pull the, the other one. But that that's just yeah. me personally. Uh, that's just the way I like to kind of like think about him and go about it. Got to roll with it, you know. Like got to roll with it. Absolutely, you you, you got to do it. You got to you got to do it. Cool, but I think I think we've actually completely played out Absolutely. dj on this one i think i think there's a lot of great positives for this guy I, and i think um i think that the gi joe community um or the toy collecting gi joe toy collecting community almost um enjoys disliking this figure and um well i, think I mean we need to change that so yeah well yeah. as i said I earlier, any I mean, other he, he, channel he, to talk about him for an hour <laughs> But the, I mean, that's the thing. It is down. easy to kind of dismiss him because he does feel very out of place. You know, when you kind of place, you're putting him up against other GI Joes in your collection, you know, like, who's he meant to go with here? You know, he's he doesn't mm. look like he long, belongs in the jungle. Um, you know, he doesn't look like he, he belongs on, on any, almost any vehicle, really. Um, unless he's kind of inside something and you can't see him. Um, right in the so MCC. he really does stand out. And I think he, he, it takes a lot of uh, thought uh, to actually find a really cool place for him. Um, yeah. Uh, it's made easier by uh, thinking of, of him outside of G.I. Joe, thinking of him as just a cool action figure. Um, as I said, I think he would have made an, an incredibly cool protagonist in any sci-fi adventure that means me and Steven would have had as kids. Um, but yeah, kind of putting him in context of G.I. Joe, it is kind of understandable why people would be kind of like poo poo him because he is very unique, very different. Um, but that's also what makes him cool, I think. Yep. I mean, I certainly wouldn't, like with other toys in the series that we've done, I would not get, personally, I would not give him five out of five. I'd probably give him closer to 3.5 to a four um, because he is so different. Um, but I still think he is very cool. But I think if you compare hmm. him up against the other figures that we've done, I, 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 I can't say he's a five out of five out of five, but I can still recommend him as a toy you should add to your collection. I think the things that make very cool, figure, but he's super unique, and I hope we've yeah. added a few more strings to his bow. Certainly, if yeah. you take him through the lens of him being analogous to Blaster from Transformers, there's your character. If that's mm. yeah, you can, if if you needed a point of reference to characterize this character that hasn't been touched much at all. By GI Joe Media, there you go. Um, and he looks good in play motion. Check out demons. Yeah, he does. <laughs> um, and for check me, out our just oh, I want to throw out a score. <laughs> okay, well, give Jess, us your, give us your score. Thank you to our oh, awesome patrons, uh, patrons uh, for your support, guys. It's super super cool. And thank you for listening to my score for DJ. I think all the things that make DJ great are also some of the things that count against him. The easily lost part, uh, pieces um, are easily lost and also quite fragile. And those are very interesting features, but also things that could, if gone, can actually make this kind of a nightmare for a collector or just for somebody who owns one, you might be like scared of messing with it too much. Uh, Rob pointed out the backpack doesn't go in the, into the back fully, which is kind of a bugger. So yeah, for me, it's 3.5 for him because yeah, My I head dig him. doesn't I think go all the way into the back of his head. Interesting. Yeah, I think you, you'll have to push that in as hard as you can. Thankfully mine, uh, it, he is loose on both of those, um, but if but yeah, if you want to be able to pull them out, you have to be very careful because uh, they can stick in there quite easily. And I see a I hairline crack there. forming on his helmet. Could be a hairline oh, crack no. or just sort of a mold imperfection. But like, 
Yeah, why? It's puzzling why they went with the choices yeah, they went with. We, yeah, me and Paul wanted it for minutes on end. But Paul, yeah. what are you giving this yes. guy? I'm giving him 3.5, man. Three, three, three and a half out of five. I think it's fair. I think, I think for it's an fair. oddball character. And guys, yeah. thanks for tuning in. And if you haven't seen it yet, here's our trailer for Demons. Check it Ooh. out and join us. But you should know in what precious little time you have left that you have lost. Oh, you have lost so totally, so completely, that history will only ever regard you and G.I. Joe with pity. Inform the commander, the experiment has been a great success. Demons premieres 6 July 2024 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Be there or miss out. Be square. Be no, there. You're not going to miss out. It'll be on the replay. But if you like to <laughs> test the premieres for these things, it will be a two-hour special. So buckle yep. in for a nice long ride. Thanks for listening, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Yo, Joe. Berg. Berg. <laughs>